Good afternoon, and I would be happy to sponsor and or co-sponsor that particular bill. Um, in the uh, 20 minutes that I've been allotted, I've been asked to talk about the gas tax increase that was enacted last session in Columbia, which raised your gas tax by 75 percent, ostensibly for the purpose of putting your roads and bridges in good condition. And I am going to talk about that. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of how it illuminates the difference between what the Republican Party and the Democratic Party stand for. And secondly, that once you identify what Republicans stand for, just how Republicans let you down last session in Columbia. So that's what I'm going to do. We recently here in Washington, D.C., and I was up there on Friday uh, and heard a lot of this, uh, in the mainstream media reports that Republicans really don't know what they stand for anymore. You, you've got, you know, so-called establishment Republicans like Mitch McConnell. You've got so-called libertarian Republicans like Rand Paul. You've got so-called moderate Republicans like our Senator Lindsey Graham. Um, you've got, uh, you know, across the board, and, and the, the theme seems to be that the Republican Party no longer knows what it is. And, and I'm here to tell you that that fundamentally is simply not true. And, and I'm going to tell you what I think a Republican is, and I'm going to contrast that with what I think a Democrat is. And then we're going to talk about that gas tax vote that was passed up in Columbia last session. Democrats believe, by and large, that the prosperity of a society, that the wealth of a society, that the well-being of individuals in a society is primarily the function of citizens, of people, of individuals coming together and acting collectively through the instrument of government. And, and you heard that articulated by Barack Obama when he first accepted the nomination for president. He talked about how government in American society is the one place where we can all come together and collectively energize ourselves and use our efforts and spend our treasure and we accomplish great things in that way. And that's what the Democratic Party essentially believes. Or it has believed that ever since, really, the FDR and the New Deal and John Maynard Keynes and that economic theory. They believe that government is the instrument through which a society prospers. Republicans fundamentally believe something quite different. Republicans believe that a prosperity of society, the wealth of a society, the well-being of a society is not driven through collective action and government, but through the millions upon millions of private transactions that occur every day in the marketplace. And as a byproduct of that competition, as a byproduct of that free market, as a byproduct of millions upon millions of supply and demand transactions occurring, that a society flourishes. And that a society will flourish in direct proportion to the degree of freedom that those individuals have. And, and let, me, let me kind of back up a little bit and put that in economic terms, because I'm working on getting my economics degree right now. So I want to um, explain it in this way. Economists like to talk about scarce resources, that every society has scarce resources in it, and that the prosperity of a society depends upon how those resources are put to use. What sort of a yield do you get on those resources? And Republicans believe that, by and large, you're always going to get a better return on scarce resources when they're in the private sector, when providers of goods and services have to compete with one another, and when consumers have the ability to choose among those providers. That dynamic maximizes a yield on what are inherently scarce resources. Now, here's a corollary of that. If that's true, and I think we can all agree that that's true, we've seen that the free market society in the United States has made us the most prosperous nation in the history of the world because of that. And the corollary of that is this. To the degree that you take money away from an inherently more productive sector, to the degree that government takes money away from the private sector and pulls it into the public sector and spends it, you're going to have less yield on those scarce resources. Because 
money that would have been productive or resources that would have been more productive in the private sector, if we take them away and move them to the public sector, you're moving them from an inherently more productive to a less productive sector. Now, how does that play into the gas tax debate? Well, the debate about the gas tax, and the reason I held it up for three years, is because the debate wasn't complete. What they were doing was they were focusing on the condition of your roads and bridges. They were looking at the interstate system, I-95 along the coast, I-85 in the upstate, I-20 connecting Florence to Aiken, I-77 going from Columbia um, up to Charlotte, or I-26 going from Charleston to Greenville, and looking at the primary roads and the secondary roads. And they were demonstrating accurately that that interstate system and primary roads and secondary roads and bridges were not in good condition. We all know that. If you've been on our roads, you realize that they weren't in good condition. The problem was this. Most of the politicians in Columbia, on both the R and D side of the aisle, considered that particular showing to be a sufficient condition precedent to raising your taxes. In other words, all they had to do was point to something that was unsatisfactory in terms of outcomes or in terms of condition, and that therefore they thought the case was made for raising your taxes and spending more of your money. My argument was this. Let's first look and see what's happened over the last several years in regard to spending. When I first went into the Senate in 2009, and nobody disputes these figures, by the way. These numbers are certified by the DOT. In 2009, we spent right about $1 billion a year on roads and bridges. This current fiscal year that we're in, without taking into account the gas tax increase that they passed, just looking at existing revenues, we're going to spend $2.3 billion on roads and bridges. So in the nine years that I've been in the Senate, we've seen annual spending on your roads and bridges go from $1 billion a year to $2.3 billion a year. No other area of state government, not education, not health care, no other area of state government has grown by 130% over a nine-year period. Now, what you haven't seen are the results that you deserve as a consequence of spending going up by 130% a year. And so my argument was this. Instead of simply pointing to roads and bridges and noting that they were in bad condition, and then deciding to take more money from people to spend on roads and bridges, first answer this question. Why is it that despite a 130% increase in the amount we're spending, that they're remaining in bad condition? What are we doing wrong? Let's get under the hood and figure out how that money's being spent. Because there's two sides of the equation here. There's the money we collect and take from you, and then there's how we spend that money. And when you look at the spending side of the equation, what you find is this that there are two executive branch agencies that control how that money gets spent. The DOT, Department of Transportation, and the State Infrastructure Bank. Those are the two executive branch agencies that actually decide how to spend that $2.3 billion that we're going to be spending this year on roads and bridges. And if you look at the DOT, and if you look at the State Infrastructure Bank, what you find is that by design, by law, through practice, through influence, that the expenditures by those two agencies are driven by politics and not by an objective assessment of what the needs actually are. And so what you find is this. For the first few years that I was in Columbia, the two individuals, there are two individuals that have the right and the power to appoint members of the State Infrastructure Bank, Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem of the Senate. They appoint a majority of the State Infrastructure Bank members that spend those t gas tax dollars. In the first few years that I was in the Senate, the Speaker of the House was Bobby Harrell from Charleston. The President Pro Tem of the Senate was Glenn McConnell from Charleston. And you saw a plurality of state infrastructure bank expenditures going in to the greater Charleston area. Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester. Empirically, you can see this is the case. Bobby had to step down, and they elected a new speaker who's from the PD region of the state. Glenn McConnell, 
resigned and became president of the College of Charleston, and we elected a new president pro tem of the Senate, who's from the PD region of the state. And as a consequence of the two politicians that have control over that state infrastructure bank, being from Charleston and now being from PD, from the PD, you saw that great fire hose of spending move counterclockwise and dump itself into the PD. My point was this. If you've seen an increase in the amount being spent on roads and bridges from $1 billion a year to $2.3 billion a year, and you haven't seen your roads and bridges being put in good condition, doesn't it make sense that before you raise gas taxes by 75% and take another $850 million a year out of your pockets, doesn't it make sense to fix the system that is actually spending that money? In fact, I don't even know how you can have a rational discussion about what the gas tax increase ought to be until the money already being collected is being spent properly. Because you don't know what the condition of those roads and bridges would be if instead of being politically wasted on pet projects where they're not needed, if it was actually put into repairing those roads, if that was the case, then we could have a rational discussion about what extra money we needed. But unless and until you do that, how in the world are you ever going to have a rational debate about what the gas tax increase should be? It's like having an algebraic equation with two variables. You can't solve for x in terms of the gas tax increase without knowing what y, the condition of our roads, would be if the money was spent wisely. So my argument was this. Instead of going to the people, and instead of your first reaction to unsatisfactory road and bridge conditions being, we need to take more money and spend it, the very first thing you have to ask yourself is, why aren't we getting better outcomes given the money we're already collecting? That ought to be the first question we ask whenever we have a problem. Whether it's the pension, whether it's K through 12, whether it's roads and bridges, what we do first in Columbia is we point to an outcome we don't like and then we take more money from you. The harder thing to do is to fix the underlying problem and to get a better yield and a better outcome based on money already being collected. We didn't do that on your behalf. The State Infrastructure Bank are still controlled by two politicians, the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem of the Senate. They wouldn't give that power up. They wouldn't surrender it. We offered that amendment up and it was voted down. Here's why it matters, going back to what I said initially. In every society, there's a scarce amount of resources. And the money that's taken away and spent by government that's money that isn't put to use in the private sector. That's called opportunity cost. Now, give me an example of that. Politicians love ribbon-cutting ceremonies. They love to stand in front of a brand new shiny building that was created with your tax dollars, and they point to it and they say, look what we've done. Look at the jobs that we've created. Look at, the, look at this building back here and look at these employees. And they get out there with a pair of scissors and they cut the blue ribbon, and they're on the front page of the newspaper above the fold, Politicians creating jobs. What they never talk about is the economic activity that's not taking place in the private sector because of the money they took away from you to give to that entity to build that building. Republicans, Republicans believe, again, the prosperity of a society is in direct proportion to the amount of scarce resources you leave in an inherently more productive sector. And the more you have government take on, the more you ask government to do, the more money you take away from people to spend on less productive things. There is not disarray in the Republican Party. There is not an absence of any core governing philosophy in the Republican Party. We believe fundamentally with what the American founders believed, which is a society is prosperous to the extent that there's freedom and that government's limited role is to provide an ordered context within which that liberty can be exercised, within which private property is protected, within which there's a common defense and public safety. And except to that extent, government ought go no further because the founders recognized that the more money you take away from the people, the less productive a society is.
That's something that we fundamentally believe as Republicans. That is not what we did on your behalf in Columbia last session. We are supposed to have a majority in the House and in the Senate who are Republicans. We're supposed to have elected officials who believe in this notion that the more money left in the private sector, the better. Who are supposed to believe that whenever there is a situation or a condition that is unsatisfactory, that the first response ought not to be to take more money from you, but to figure out why we're not getting a better yield based on the money we're already collecting. We didn't do that. We left in place the same politically corrupt and politically driven system on spending your money, and we take another $850 million out of your pocket and put it into that very same system that despite a 130% increase in annual spending, hasn't gotten the job done. That's not conservative. That's not Republican. That's not believing in limited government. That's not having faith in the private sector. That's not having faith in free markets. And I tell you this, unless and until we have elected officials in Colombia who govern the way they campaign, unless they go ahead and start casting votes that look after your money, that make the hard decisions, that disrupt the status quo, that anger senior lawmakers, until those politicians in that Senate, and I'll just talk about the Senate because that's what I know, until those politicians in the Senate fear the people back home more than they fear the people in the front row, you're not gonna get the government you deserve. There is a disconnect right now between what the people of South Carolina want, what the people of South Carolina believe, and how your elected officials are voting. And the only way to correct that lack of correlation between what the people want and what politicians are doing is to hold your politicians accountable for their votes. Ask them why they increased a 75% gas tax without fixing the politically driven way in which that money is spent. Ask them why they went ahead and increased your contributions to the state pension plan by $860 million a year without fixing the plan structure and allowing public employees to have unsustainable defined benefit plans instead of defined contribution plans. Ask them why they go ahead and they collect more money from you and dump it into a K-12 public education system when they're already collecting 24th in the nation in per pupil funding but getting 51st in outcomes, including the, the District of Columbia. Ask them why they're not doing the harder thing, which is getting a bigger and better return on what you put in, rather than simply looking to you first. I came up here to drive that message home. I've been traveling around the state to drive that message home because I've spent too many years in Columbia and spent too much time away from my law practice and my family to not see some fundamental changes in how your business is being conducted. And right now, it is not being conducted in connection with your best interests. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and I appreciate your attendance.